This may be an indication of how Mr. Trump will bridge the divide within his own party, and it may tell us a bit about the direction in which his administration could go in the first 100 days. Coordination between a commander-in-chief and the Hill could mean a lot of action in our nation's capital. Remember how deadlocked it's been for a decade, if you include maybe the last two of President George W. Bush's presidency years, and many critics do include those years. Donald Trump announcing his chief of staff is a huge and important first step, but there is more to report from the president-elect at this hour. Coming into view, what a Trump administration will look like on day one. Two of his most trusted advisors from the campaign are taking key roles. RNC Chairman Reince Priebus, as I just mentioned, chief of staff, and former campaign CEO Steve Bannon will be the head of conservative Breitbart News website, that's how you know him, and this will be his chief strategist and counselor. The president-elect's transition team is making it official with this statement this evening. Quote, Bannon and Priebus will continue to effective, uh, the effective leadership team they formed during the campaign, working as equal partners to transform the federal government, making it much more efficient, effective, and productive, end quote. So all eyes have been on Trump Tower, as you might imagine, for at least the last couple of hours since the news started to take shape. RNC Communications Director Sean Spicer had this to say about his boss being named Chief of Staff as he was coming out of the tower. Watch. What's your reaction? To what? The doctor was about the, the two points today. The, the great, great pick, wasn't it? We begin with Doug McElway, who is following this breaking story from outside the Trump Tower in New York City. And, Doug, this news began coming in, as I mentioned a couple of hours ago, news outlets scrambling to confirm it. What exactly are the facts? Well, the facts are that they issued a statement at about 4.30 this afternoon to the effect that rights and Steve Bannon would be placed in these positions. There had been some sourced reporting as early as a half an hour or an hour before that that this was indeed going to be the case. And certainly we had heard rumblings as far back as election night that Rice Priebus would get the, the chief of staff job. We saw an indication uh, that it would, uh, might be so when Trump singled out Priebus in those victory remarks at the Hilton Hotels in the wee hours of Wednesday morning, calling him up to the stage and asking him to make remarks. Now, Steve Bannon was much more of a behind-the-scenes player, making almost no public appearances during the cam campaign. It was only when Kellyanne Conway mentioned him this morning with uh, Chris Wallace on Fox News Sunday, saying that he was the general who really orchestrated this victory, and that his true influence became known. Uh, we really started to understand how his influence uh, among the anti-Washington, anti-establishment uh, people across the country resonated, especially with white working class people who had felt so disenfranchised. Those are the people who helped to put Donald Trump over the top. The previous pick is meeting with high praise among uh, the establishment GOP in the aftermath of this announcement late today. Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina tweeting out, and I quote, Congrats to at real Donald Trump for outstanding choice of rights to be chief of staff. It shows me he is serious about governing. And House Speaker Paul Ryan tweeting out shortly thereafter, I'm very proud and excited for my friend Wrights. Congrats. Those two, by the way, go way back in Wisconsin politics. Wrights Priebus got a start at the age of 16 volunteering for campaigns there. Some say he is very responsible for the uh, promotion to national stature of House Speaker Paul Ryan and also Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker. President-elect Donald Trump issuing a statement late today which said Steve and Reitz are highly qualified leaders who worked well together on our campaign and led us to a historic victory. Now I will have them both with me at the White House as we make America great again. And these two men will, by the way, play, uh, play very serious roles when it comes to staffing up, ramping up this transition team and the administration itself. They've got well over 4,000 jobs to fill, 4,000 jobs to vet, and a very short time to do it before Inauguration Day. Harris, back to you. January 20th. Always good to see you, Doug. Thank you very much. And for more on this, I'm joined by Ed Rollins. He's a former campaign manager for Reagan Bush 84 and chief strategist for the Great America PAC and Trump Super PAC. Uh, and, of course, you know, we've heard, Ed, a lot of people saying what they think and a lot of speculation. But tonight I wanted to ask somebody who would actually know, because you were one of the people who brought in some money for the Trump campaign. And, and also kind of ran a co But more important than the, the f former titles, uh, my first big job in Washington, I was the assistant to the president in the White House for President Reagan. Mm -hmm. So I know what a chief of staff does. I know what a counselor does. I know how a 
White House operates. I did that for three years, went out and ran the re-election campaign, and then came back in the second term. So I know, I know what all this means, and what it means is you've got two superb people. Uh, they will both have big responsibilities. They will be teamed up. Uh, obviously, the day-to-day -day aspect, Chairman Priebus, who, who's a fabulous guy, will basically oversee a, a very large staff. And, and Mr. Bannon, who is a brilliant strategist, will basically have the time and the resources to, to develop the communication plan, the effectiveness of the strategy. They'll both be in every meeting of the president, that's the way it works, and there'll be several others who will be named later. Uh, and, and a president gets a collective think. It's not just a singular person who walks in and says, I'm the chief of staff, do this. Presidents like to have the decisions, uh, and they like to have them vetted out. And so I think you could not get two better people who will work very closely. Now, the one warning that I give them both is... There are no fences in the White House, so you've got these seven or eight all type A personalities, and these two certainly aren't are type A personalities. I don't mean that in a derogatory way. You couldn't survive or get there if you weren't. I'm type A. I think you are, too. I am, too. So we'll just take but, it as a compliment. But at the end of the day, you have to divide the turf and know whose turf is what, uh, and it becomes very important. We had a similar situation. We had Jim Baker, who was the chief of staff. We had Ed Meese, longtime Reaganite, who was the counselor to the president, mm -hmm. uh, and, and they divided the turf up. Every so often, the little crosses because of swords, but that's not a bad thing. My sense is these two guys will work very well together. Can I ask you a couple of questions? One has to do with the relationship that our president-elect had with the media and with the establishment. And the irony that his picks would be a member of the media and a member of the establishment for those two very important jobs in the White House. What does that mean? Well, I think, the, I think being a candidate, running a campaign, getting elected president is one faction. Running a country, being the president of the United States, when you've never been in government, is a totally different challenge. This president has a very aggressive agenda that he wants to implement, and I think he'll have great success. In order to do that, he's going to basically oversee a, a variety of people, and equally as important is a shared responsibility. The president doesn't get to do everything he wants to do because the Constitution sets up the Congress. Mm -hmm. Congress controls the money, controls the legislation. And even though there's only 1.6 miles between the door of the White House and the Capitol, that might as well be an ocean. The Congress does not feel it works for the president and vice versa. So how did we get to, and, and again, I just asked this question because I, I think it comes down to the people that maybe he is friends with, and that's not an anomaly. I know some critics tonight I've been reading on social media, well, you know, it seems like he's picking people who he's friends with, even though it is a member of the establishment and it is a member of the media. But that's what people do. Well, you need, you need to have people that you trust. I mean, you, you want someone who's counseled, you, and, he, and he's worked with both of these people the last several months in this campaign. He knows of all the people in the country, the president has access to anybody in the world he wants to come give advice. There's two and a half million people. In Including the, you, by the way. Well, You've been doing uh, some of that. Well, I, I try and do it from television. <laughs> uh, I, spent, I spent 25 years of my life in government. I don't want to go in. I don't want to go in again. I'm an old man. But the, the critical thing here is he has the ability to bring anybody in. The key thing here is you've got to basically know who you can. You have to know the man. Uh, he has to get what he wants. People ask me, well, what about his kids? I said, if he trusts his kids and his kids have been trained by him and they give him good counsel, that's what you you want you want as much counsel because it's an impossible job under the best of circumstances and it's going to be really an impossible job because he is going to be the ultimate change agent i heard you in the green room you and i were talking you said confidant and competence i believe were the two words that Absolutely. you used uh you know we saw president obama do this as he was entering the, the white house it was Rahm Emanuel, and then one name that we remember she wasn't that high up but but sometimes things don't work out desiree desiree rogers and i only mention that because many people pick their friends but you said it's that competency that, that really well look, especially at this level uh and and even with Rahm Emanuel, Rahm Emanuel came from the congress he wanted to be speaker of the house he wanted the same job the president had uh, you know at the end of the day you want someone who serves your staff and the nice thing about Priebus, you are chief of staff. It's a big fancy title, but you really are staff. And sometimes people don't think of themselves as staff. They get that title, they get on TV the whole bit. The White House staff is very, very powerful today, and the authority of the government of the president is delegated to cabinets. So you have to make sure the cabinets are doing what the president wants. This is a training ground for all of them, and, and, and this president, as I said, has an, has an insurmountable task ahead of him and this kind of team will help him get there. I, I want to say this and make a point. Um, very impressive way to beat the competition that basically spent ten times the amount of money that you and others helped raise for the Trump campaign. 
Um, so congratulations on that, because well, I know that, that that was not, that was a first. I mean, we've never seen anything quite like that, at least in the open air. So, but to do that, and I know this from experience, you sell on promise and you sell on commitment. And so you would have an idea of what the first 100 days would look like based on what you think he can get done and what he will get done. What, what are your impressions that you I, I think I think the first thing he can do, he can he'll wipe out a lot of the executive orders of, of President Obama. Which one would he start with? Well, I, there's a whole series of them. I, don't, I think it's, I think it's going to be a long list, and here's all the ones that are executive orders, so he'll eliminate them all. Obviously, he's talked in terms of the court. By President Obama. By President Obama. Okay. Uh, and and, and they're exactly that. They're an executive order, and they can be repealed by an executive. Uh, other, other stuff needs to be repealed by the Congress. First thing he has is he has, a, has to have a continued resolution for the budget. This will be his budget. Uh, it's been made up by the Obama team, but it's going to be his imprint. He's going to have to Any do that. Any difference that you can uh, name? Just I'm, one, I'm sure, I, I can't off the top of my head, but I'm sure there's very significant differences from what he wants to do. Okay. Third thing is obviously the wall, the immigration pro policy. Does he get that built? Was that one of the things uh, he, that was promised? I, it was promised, and I think obviously it's one of the most important things he can do. It's not something that can get done the first 10 days or the first 100 days. What he can do is he can, he can basically implement changes in the Obamacare, which he's promised to do, and the Congress has already voted to outlaw or re re replace uh, and, and change. Parts of, yeah. and, and, okay. and, and so they, they know what they're doing. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things that the Congress already has done and basically was either vetoed or threatened by veto by President Obama. They can get that stuff done. A hundred days is a false uh, measurement. Yeah. But, it's, but it's a real measurement in the sense that every media writes the hundred day stories. That was the Roosevelt plan. So every president tries to get things accomplished. Sometimes the Congress it takes longer. So I think the key thing is what can you give me? What is it? What are the priorities of Mitch McConnell? What are the priorities of Speaker Ryan? Here are the priorities of the new president. Let's see what we can get together and get moving. And, and I mentioned the wall because we know that he talked about it on the trail and that was a promise to voters. But, but from your perspective, from um, those people who would actually have given to the campaign and have some anticipation, you're saying that it's still being talked about. Well, my, my sense of the, the, the wall is the wall is all part of a changing of the immigration laws of the country and certainly the implementation of that's going to be very, very important. All right. Coordination. Paul Ryan tweeted out about Ryan Spribus. I am very proud and excited for my friend. Congrats. Uh, that kind of coordination, as I mentioned off the top of the hour here, can lead to a very active 100 days and certainly what you just outlined. Ed Rollins, my friend, always good to see you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for Thank being you. here. Well, right now, an arrest in the, quote, execution of a sheriff's deputy. The latest on what led to the victim's death and the man you see here in custody, how that happened. And a deadly earthquake in one of the most picturesque places in the world. That and more. Stay close. It was an execution. That's what a California sheriff is saying about one of his men who was shot and killed in the line of duty earlier today. And now a suspect is in custody. This is happening in Stanislaus County. That's in about the center part of the state. Will Carr is live from the, with the news from Los Angeles. And Will, how was the deputy shot? Well, Harris, the reason that the sheriff is calling this an execution is because he says the suspect took the gun, put it to the deputy's forehead, and then shot him twice in the head. This took place this morning about an hour and 45 minutes west of San Francisco. Authorities say that Deputy Dennis Wallace confronted the suspect who was wanted on a felony warrant. That's when Wallace was shot and killed. The suspect took off carjacking a Kia Rio. He was later taken into custody two and a half hours south after he tried to steal a woman's purse. And it was only after he was arrested that authorities realized it was the man who allegedly killed Deputy Wallace. I want to remember, and I want all of you to remember, the Wallace family. We need to keep them in our thoughts and prayers. We need to keep law enforcement in our thoughts and prayers. It's time to stand united. It's time to stand together with public safety and with law enforcement to stop what's happening in our nation. Wallace was a 20-year veteran of the Stanislaus Sheriff's Department. Harris. Well, it has been uh, an unfortunate weekend for other officers as well, because this was not the only officer shot this weekend. That's exactly right. If you include today's fatal shooting, four members of law enforcement on the West Coast have been shot in just the past three days. That includes on Saturday when a police officer in Anchorage, Alaska, was shot multiple times. The officer was conducting a traffic stop when a man started firing. The officer is expected to survive. The suspect was shot and killed. I have watched the video from this situation. It was a clear and intentional ambush, but 
It'll take a while to sort through the information. On Friday, two officers and a police canine were shot in Boise, Idaho. The officers were doing a yard-to-yard -yard search for a shooting suspect when that suspect opened fire. The suspect was shot and killed. Corporal Chris Davis with the police department was released from the hospital on Friday. Another veteran remains in critical condition. The canine, whose name was Jardo, was killed in the crossfire. Harris. Bill Carr, thank you very much. And this is the latest now on what's happening over in Iraq. Iraqi forces advancing against the Islamic State savages in Mosul. Remember, we're part of that operation to take back that city. But the going has been, well, as vicious as the enemy. What those bloodthirsty terrorists are doing in a last-ditch effort to keep their final stronghold inside Iraq. And it has been one year since the terror attack in Paris, where 130 people were gunned down. A tribute to those who died. This weekend, France is marking one year since the deadly terror attacks across Paris. Remember, cafes and a concert hall were hit in that. A special mass was held today at Notre Dame Cathedral, paying tribute to the 130 people who died in the attacks on November 13, 2015. And President Francois Hollande led a balloon released in honor of the victims. The French Prime Minister and the Mayor of Paris also attended that event, which was outside City Hall. Wow, a year ago. The Iraqi army says troops have now driven ISIS out of the town just south of Mosul. Remember, we're trying to take that back. We're helping them out. The offensive has been long and brutal, with waves of car bombs slowing the troops' advance. Connor Powell has more from our Jerusalem Bureau. Connor? Paris Iraqi troops continue to make slow and steady progress in their battle to retake Mosul from militants. But as ISIS is losing territory there, they are succeeding in causing a high number of casualties among Iraqi troops by sending a wave of suicide attackers and car bombs while IEDs continue to wreak havoc on Iraqi troops. Still, Iraqi commanders say they liberated two more neighborhoods in Mosul this weekend and insurgents also lost control of the ancient city of Nimrod, just south of Mosul. The famed Assyrian ruins there date back to the 13th century BC and are some of the Middle East's most important historical sites. The town of Nimrod was captured by ISIS two years ago. Militants then began destroying the historical archaeological site, deeming it un-Islamic. The battle to retake Mosul began almost a month ago, and while Iraqi forces are making progress, nobody expects it to wrap up anytime soon. Harris? Connor, thank you. At least two people are dead after a powerful earthquake rocked New Zealand. The magnitude 7.8 quake caused a ferry loading ramp to collapse. It ripped apart roads. It took out windows and caused items to fall off the shelves as far away as the country's capital, Wellington. People there are saying that the tremors lasted about three minutes. Wow. And were followed by a number of aftershocks. Three minutes is a long time. Rain. Doors. I'm having to hold on to things. Doors were opening and closing. Um, the whole house was moving. Yeah, it, it was moving. It creaking. Was creaking, moving. It was, uh, it was pretty, yeah, it was, it was, it was a, a scary thing. Officials are not declaring a state of emergency. They say the region is adequately dealing with the situation. So the pieces are starting to fall into place. This is where we started the hour on what a Donald Trump White House will look like, likely on day one. Two very different men tapped as the keystones of the Trump administration. So what does it all mean for the Republican agenda when they take control in January? We'll talk more about that with the political insiders when they slide in. And what will happen to Secretary Hillary Clinton inside the Democratic Party? You know, a couple of our insiders are Democrats. We'll ask President-elect Trump. Not sure if he will appoint a special prosecutor or not to go after her about the email server and so on and so forth. The insiders will talk about it. A lot of politics and fallout to break down. Stay with us. All right, let's rock and roll with the Fox News political insiders. Pat Cadell, strategic advisor to President Jimmy Carter, a Fox News yep. contributor as well. Good to see you, my friend. Doug Schoen, former strategic advisor to President Bill Clinton. Six years in the White House doing that, now a Fox News contributor. John LeBoutelier here in New York with me on set, a former field director for President Ford in the 76 campaign and a New York congressman formerly as well. Always good to see you. I'm actually going to start with you, Doug Schoen, because uh, I would imagine it's sure. been a very interesting week for you uh, after having 
having declared that you would not be voting for your friend Hillary Clinton and then seeing Donald Trump become our president-elect, I want to first get your thoughts because we haven't heard them yet. Well, you know, Harris, I, when I said it, I just really spoke from the heart. It was a matter of conscience. And I think for a lot of Americans, not that they listen to me and they frankly shouldn't, but they make their own mind up. And I think a lot of Americans in the last week basically said, we can't vote for Secretary Clinton, and they started a revolution. It is a huge, huge change in politics that I can say the political insiders, Pat and John especially, predicted a couple of years ago. It came to fruition, and the election of Donald Trump represents that uh, momentous change in American <coughs> politics. All right, let's talk about the big news this hour, John, uh, of the two appointments by, or selections, announcements by the president-elect now in Reince Priebus, who was part of the establishment, head of the RNC, and in the media, conservative, Breitbart News guy, Steve Bannon. Your thoughts? Well, I, I think it's the beginning of a lot of this stuff where we're going to flesh out what the government's going to look like. But the key guy in the government is the president-elect, and, and he's really the only one that matters. These people will carry out whatever he wants. But the bigger picture is why he is the president-elect. And, and Doug said two years. It's really five years the political insiders have been on talking about first a pre... And Pat was really way ahead of it. Pre-revolutionary moment back in 2011 and 12. And the revolution was the public has lost complete faith in the establishment, the government, both parties. Eighty-six percent of people felt and still feel alienated from this establishment and the political system. Eighty-six percent. And that powered this thing. And Trump had this innate uh, marketing sense a year and a half ago to, to get on this thing. He was way ahead of it. He watched our show every Sunday night. He used to... You know that. He told us all. For a long time, he watched this show, and he knew he was smart enough to figure out that we were onto this thing. And we didn't know it would be Trump. We knew a revolution was coming. We didn't know it'd be this year. It's here. We're not in a pre-revolutionary moment anymore. We're in the revolution. Uh, Pat Cadell, I want to get your thoughts on just the breaking news today of who he's chosen as the pieces kind of come together, well, and how important it is uh, that we understand kind of where we're going in those first 100, 100 days. What the signals? Well, I think it's important that, he, you know, and I think he's picking a, a broad team. He's got someone who's good, able to talk to the regular members of the Republican Party, and he has chosen his strategist, uh, I think, a great role for Steve Bannon, who has been a visionary on what needs to, of where this country is headed and being willing to support Donald Trump on the kinds of issues that need to be raised. I think that's a good thing. Look, we have had a historic moment here. Let us sit back and give this man his rightful due, which I think, unfortunately, too many people who had dismissed him and who were wrong about the election and continue to be wrong about why he won. Well, Let's and some of them are in the media personal. admitting it today. Did you see what the New York Times said? They're going to rededicate themselves to, I guess, how they're going to do journalism. I, I don't even know where you start to do well, that. Go I, ahead, Pat. You know, they might start by having journalism, but uh, they might start by doing their jobs as opposed to being the, you know, outriders of a political party. Look, Donald Trump stood alone. He stood alone against the party establishment of both parties in Washington, a united media against him pretty much for the mainstream media, trying to bring him down, uh, so many interest groups and so many others, and he was, was money he would not take, whose support he would not take, and he had only one thing going for him, and that was the people. And he had the people because, and look at the results, he won evangelicals so much bigger than Romney did, or anyone else, he won. He got a better vote, as we predicted, with African Americans mm -hmm. and Hispanics than the polls predicted. He won, and most of all, he attracted so many of what Doug and John were talking about, the disaffected in America. He has an opportunity that in the new paradigm of American politics to reshape the entire history. This is a potential moment because he is more 
He has a better grip on where this country is and what it needs. And he was out there in the last camp, the, the days of the campaign making the right argument that this was a choice. And by the way, if you read my, I had a piece on Monday and, you know, there was an you could see this coming. It was coming because there were people who were in distress. Doug okay. spoke for millions of Democrats who, by the way, decided they couldn't go there either. But he became, he knows one thing. He is the people's choice. They were the vehicle. They were the movement that propelled him. And he understood he was there, that he was spoke for them. All right. Doug, I, I do, I don't want to gloss over something. Uh, you know, we've seen these protests now. This is the fifth day of them that we've seen them in sure. cities across, the, across America. And, I mean, peaceful protesting is one thing. Some of these have not been. I've seen uh, an true. effigy burned of Donald Trump. And, and yep. I just, I ask, the, you know, as you talk with people in your own party, what you're saying to take down the drama in all of this. We have a new president-elect. Sure. They didn't do it with President Obama. We've never seen really. It, I mean, right. I turned on the TV. It looked like a ram. They were burning effigies of someone. It, it was bizarre to me. Excellent. Excellent question. And really, two messages. To Donald Trump, bring the country together. Heal bring Democrats in, people like Pat Cadell, who correctly and uniquely predicted his victory, and to uh, the Democrats, cooperate. This is in the interest of our country. There will be aspects of his agenda on taxation, on infrastructure that they can and indeed need to support. And unless we pull together from both sides, Harris will be divided and will have these terrible and potentially tragic incidents that you speak of. All right, we're going to go to a quick commercial, but when we come back, I'm seeing some chatter on, on, on Twitter about, John, what to do with Hillary Clinton, because it was asked of Donald Trump in a recent interview, what would you do? Um, would you name that special prosecutor? We'll talk about it when we come back. Stay with us. The Fox News political insiders are back all across the screen. All right, John, I'm going to start with you uh, with this question to Donald Trump about what happens with Hillary Clinton. I do want to point out that the FBI director, James Comey, has said even after that part due, that, that second look that they did with the investigation right before Election Day, still the conclusion was the same, no criminal charges, that he would recommend uh, the DOJ. So now right. we go forward. Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton. I think everybody's going to just put the Clintons in the rearview mirror. I don't think the House is going to pursue it. They were talking about looking into the whole investigation of the email thing. And we haven't even talked about the foundation. What about the foundation? Yeah, well, I, I think the foundation is going to dry up. I think Taneo, the company... Which stops the investigation, I guess. I don't well, know. Well, no, if they already did bad things. But I just don't think a new administration wants to get bogged down in going after the former Secretary of State. There's just no purpose to so it, and it's a distraction. When, when you look say? at people like Congressman Jason Chaffetz, though, who promised to get to the bottom of things regardless of who won, what do you say? Well, I Ooh. say he's not done it. Uh, Harris, <laughs> Harris, we got to pull together as a country. What no. John said is right. We, there's on. nothing to be served by prosecuting Secretary Clinton or even investigator. Let's go forward. Let's address the problems of the country. Pat? You know, can I, I, I dissent from this in one sense. You know, we had, uh, you know, everyone knows who should have been elected. There had been no further investigation. There are serious things here. Seventy-five percent or more of the American people believe that there are two standards of justice in this country. And that's part of the reason, along with the 80-some percent who believe the system is rigged for the rich and powerful against their interests. And that includes many people who even voted for Clinton. I think that the, the, I agree with my colleagues on one thing. The administration doesn't need to get into a vindictive or whatever. But the rule of law cannot be dispensed. And I have said before, I think sometime in this process, the, just, the Attorney General has got should appoint a special counsel from outside Washington who's totally reputable and let them decide all these things that need to be dealt with. You cannot just, and then if there's, and Trump, Donald Trump, President Trump should be able to say, and if there's nothing there, fine. But you know what? He made a commitment, and the country wants a commitment to law. It's yeah, a fact. Notion I'm that, some of that. But I am, ahead, I am not. But, but listen to what I said. I said not to be vindictive. He should say he doesn't want this politics in his administration. No. They have other things to do, but someone needs to make sure that, the, that there is rule of law here. All right. I, I want to move on and talk about something that uh, President-elect Trump said tonight about deporting up to 3 million illegal 
immigrants who have committed crimes in this country. What would that look like exactly? Well, it's a massive bureaucratic mess to do it. You've got to round them up. So Everyone, you're saying he shouldn't try to well, do that? Hold on. Every one of them is entitled to a federal court hearing. A lawyer has to represent them. All that goes on. If they're truly bad guys, if they're the bad hombres he talked about in the debates, if they're murderers and rapists, they got to go. But I don't know that there are three million such people. I don't know. Doug? Yeah, I, I, I would echo what John says. Look, he made a campaign promise over and over and over. And if these are criminals, they got to go. But we do preserve, as Pat was saying, the rule of law for everyone, and they deserve a fair hearing. And if they should go, they got to go. All right, so you guys are in agreement but we know, on that. But we do know that. But we do know one thing, Harris, that we have the ICE and it has been forced to, in this administration, has let hundreds of thousands of people who committed crimes, let them go, let them loose, and have done nothing about this. And you, the country knows it and wants it, just like they believe over two to one. Sanctuary City shouldn't be funded. The rule of law should be observed. By the way, let me just say on the political aspect of this three million thing, what it will look like if they start trying to round these people up. And the media, which is in the tank for the Democrats... But if these people Democrats, are criminals here, it, it will look like they're doing justice, no? Oh, yeah, but I don't know who they are. I'm just saying, I'm thinking of the George Soros, the people who are running these well, look, demonstrations. Look, I'm thinking of Kate Steinle's family and, and the fact that they probably would not have cared what it politically looked like if it would have saved their daughter. I, Harris, I agree. But I'm saying, look at these demonstrations every night. Now, you don't think... If, we, if they start rounding up people, that uh, these demonstrations will multiply more and more? I think they will. I think you got to take that into account. All right. I, I want to move on real quickly to Obamacare, because you and I were talking in the break, John, about sure. what the structuring needs to look like. Doug, you have some thoughts on that. Go ahead. I, I do. I was very gratified by what Donald Trump said. Uh, I think it was yesterday that he would keep uh, uh, the prohibition on denying care for pre-existing conditions and let people keep their policy up to uh, the age of 26. But we need competition among states. We need the ability to purchase across state lines. That's what he's been talking about. We need to get to that pretty quickly and get rid of the guts of Obamacare, which this election said people don't want. Yeah, and it turned out to be a bipartisan issue, as I, I brought up many times uh, you know, here on the Correct. program, that there were as many Democratic voters who were being disgusted by those double digits. I mean, if you lived in Arizona, for instance, it was a 116 percent increase yeah. in some of the premiums. I, I do want to get the sense. So uh, we've just learned that the president will hold a news conference at 3.15 p.m. in the briefing room before departing for his trip overseas. This is tomorrow. Pat, I'm unfinished business? What's the president doing? And it would be nice to hear him say to those protesters in the streets, knock it off with the violence, we have a new president-elect. I'm yeah. just saying, but go ahead. Yeah, it would be nice to have him, Harry Reid, and several other people, including Hillary Clinton, say that. Um, because, they, because, you know, and as I keep saying, maybe they should ask him whether they voted or not. Uh, but, mm. but this notion that we... You know, I mean, really, we had an election Tuesday. In this country, we all must observe the result of that election, because otherwise we don't have, as Teddy White once wrote, it is the only alternative to a, to, to a life of jungle. But let me just say another thing. This president, this attack on him as being, you know, he's a racist. This man has made a commitment that no Republican has ever made to go in and build the economy in the schools, in the inner cities. That's why I believe many blacks, even more than probably the exit poll shows, blacks and Hispanics voted for him. Mm. He has a unique opportunity to reshape the entire political structure of this country with that initiative. He has said it all along, and we didn't do it for votes. And I tell you what, that is when people see that, we start seeing a president who is willing to bring the country and speak for everyone. That's his opportunity, and I think he'll, he, he would be crazy not to take it, and I think he is sincere. All right, we'll be right back. Final thoughts next. So one of the things that I'm seeing on my Twitter feed now is Women for Trump, Erie, Pennsylvania, picking up on our conversation about Donald Trump mentioning that he would possibly deport up to three million illegal immigrants who committed crimes. Uh, she says illegals are not citizens and have no rights to courtrooms. They have to go. Actually, you beg to differ. Well, I'm sorry. It's just not the law. Actually, the law the is do. Yeah, yeah. Everybody in America has rights, whether you're a citizen or not, whether you're here legally or not.
Right. And I'm liking people, uh, people's tweets so that they know that I'm getting to them, and we appreciate that from Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, Doug Cho, one of the things I'm also seeing here has to do with Michigan yeah. and how misunderstood the economy was there, that people at least feel that it was there sure. by Hillary Clinton and the, and the Democrats. There's a lot of work that needs to go forth in your party to get a message out. And maybe it was the you know, elite nature of your candidate that you ran, I'm not sure. You can weigh in on that. But, but there's a gap sure. between the haves and the have-nots oh. and the messaging coming out of your party. Uh, uh, absolutely. Two points, Harris, quickly. First, the Democratic Party is out of, uh, out of touch. If they make uh, Keith Ellison from uh, oh. Minnesota the head of the DNC, it will be almost curtains for the Democrat. But the larger message, which Pat so eloquently stated, Donald Trump has an opportunity to address the problems of the economy, to promote growth, cut taxes, create jobs, and lead America forward as Ronald Reagan did. If he can do that, we'll have a new and great American century, and if he brings America together, he can be a transformational president. Pat, your name we all, up there. regardless of party, should work for him. Uh, can I come, uh, uh, Please go. Yeah, I, I just want to say this for all the people who disdain the American people. And I said this election ultimately was a choice of who was the master in this democracy: the people, or a self-serving political class in their media uh, swells. But I'll tell you what. I want to end this with Donald Trump. Be as, as one great Democratic president said they can be as big as they wish. But he knows, and I know, and we all know, that the, the thing that we should remember, it is the people who giveth, the people who taketh away, and blessed be the name of the American people. Wow. Uh I want to come back to you just real quickly because I, I'm watching some things in my Twitter feed as we wrap up with final thoughts here. Um, the resolution for the budget, continuing resolution, was one of the things that Ed Rollins talked about that Donald Trump will have as president uh, first to get to. Um, the wall and the promise. Today we heard him say something about, well, parts of it may be a fence. What do you think should be the criteria for you know, going forward those first 100 days? And Ed pointed out, and it's fair, that kind of in the media we create that window, that deadline. Right. Well, uh, listen, we go back to the speech that Mr. Trump made in Gettysburg about a month ago on his first 100 days, what he hoped to accomplish. Mm -hmm. He's already told us what he hopes to do. And I bet he does 85 percent, which would be great if he could get most of that done. Do you have minutes. faith in him because of who he is, the messenger, or the fact that bicamerally, He'll be yoked to Congress. But, I mean, he's he got Republicans there, in charge. There, even uh, someone mentioned Reagan here. Reagan had a Democratic House of Representatives to overcome with Tip O'Neill. Uh, Mr. Trump has nothing. He has a Republican House, Republican Senate, and a Democratic Party in complete disarray. So there's nothing stopping him and the Republicans from doing various things. And we're going to find out what their list of priorities are. We don't know yet. What do you think it should start with? I think, well, I think... I think well, the, the continuing budget obviously is. Well, that he has to do, but I think number point. one, he's got to do some stuff with taxes, bringing back corporate profits mm. to juice up the economy, propose what his health care new plan will be, because that's going to be tricky. Uh, and it has to be both affordable, but it also has to do something to bring full time work back. That bill, Obamacare, killed millions of full time jobs. It wasn't just a health care disaster, it was a job disaster. What do you, Pat, think is probably the greatest risk for Democrats right now? If, if they're not careful going forward, you would fill in that blank with what? Well, I would tell you that they're in real trouble because Donald Trump brought not only himself, but he brought notice every senator except the three or rather one candidate should have won, who were, you know, deserted him, they paid a price. He, the Republicans only lost five House seats, which is incredible. And they won more in the state level than the legislature. Donald Trump pulled them through, too. This is a, the Democratic Party is hollowed out. And it's been hollowed out by super elitists and people who think they know better than the Democrats. And they, you know, this looking down their nose and thinking it's only identity politics that they've been able to do. They're in real trouble. And if you pick, if they, I am echo what Doug said, if their answer to this is to pick an, an extremist as the head of the Democratic Party, then, which is what Keith Ellison is, oh, God, for, God help them all. Wow, strong language. Doug, uh, before we move on, Bernie Sanders, what role does he play moving forward? Do you think Donald Trump would tap I, him for anything? He let him I don't think too. Donald Trump will no way. tap him, but the two of them can work together 
to change trade policy. If the left and the right work together again, it is in Donald Trump's interest. The larger message here is that Trump can bring the country together and go forward with a and new vision. And they can drain the swamp together. That's a big choice. Absolutely. Always great to That'd see you, terrific. gentlemen. Thank you very much. We'll be right back. Busy hour, President-elect's journey has begun as he is filling job posts. Two big ones today, a chief of staff, a lead counselor, President-elect Donald Trump going forward. 4,000 or more so jobs to go uh, before he takes office January 20th. And President Obama set to give a news conference tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern. We've heard that announcement this evening. What is it about? What is he expecting?